Hello, my friends. Welcome back to the Green Cards to Greenback show. My name is Nestor Vargas. I am a humble host. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you guys are doing great. Now, if you're new to the show, this show is where financially successful first-generation immigrants reveal the steps they took to avoid low-paying jobs, build generational wealth, and attain the American dream. Additionally, we discuss investing and retirement planning topics. All right, Antonio, thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate you taking the time. So, you know, I, I always want to get started with maybe you walking us through a little bit more about your background, you know, where are your parents from, you know, how did you guys come over, over here, where did you land? Yes, thank you, Nestor. My story always starts in Durango, Mexico. It's the northern part of the country. And we migrated to the United States and in search for more opportunities. My parents wanted to have myself and the rest of my siblings have education opportunities so that we could eventually become our full selves. And we did start living in Texas, in El Paso. We lived there for four years. And we moved to North Carolina in early 2000, where we're always, where we are right now. And how old, how old were you when you, came to, when you came to the States? So I was five. Okay. I was five years old. And one question I always get is, where are you from? Which is one of those complex questions that I really can't define and tell everyone where I'm from. I'm from many places. I am both from Durango, from El Paso, and from North Carolina, where I'm currently in. Man, I, I love the way you answer that question because I came here when I was seven years old. And you know, one of the things that people ask me sometimes, because you know, I'm I love soccer, the World Cup. My friends is like, so who are you rooting for, the U.S. or Colombia? And I'm like, both. <laughs> I'm from both places. So that's that's really funny. So five years old, Texas, then you guys headed over to North Carolina. And so elementary school in Texas, mm -hmm. middle school and high school in in North Carolina. Tell me a little bit more about what you remember about that middle school, high school phase. Nestor, it's, you know, middle school, one of those horror stories where everything starts. <laughs> it's, it was a crucial but very fulfilling time in my life. It was exactly trying to figure out who I was as, an, as a migrant student, someone who had migrated from Mexico to the United States, navigating multiple systems, education, specifically language. I did not learn a lot of English in El Paso. I went to predominantly Spanish-speaking elementary school. So coming here to Durham, I began to learn more, more of that language, English, and my world just became more open with many challenges, including navigating my multiple identities, being Latino, Latinx, and as well being a migrant and Spanish speaker, being bilingual, navigating the fine line between being Mexican-American and, you know, speaking a new language, understanding my, my, my place in this world. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so tell me a little bit more about, you obviously found your identity. And I say obviously for our listeners, if you don't follow Antonio on LinkedIn, please do. He has just amazing resources on how to be a better artist and really how to be a, an amazing human being. But you found yourself. And so tell me a little bit more about what was your drive? At what point in time or what was that guiding light that helped you get through this time? You know, I think I always go back to college because I was having a conversation with a good friend of mine today. I didn't really have an understanding of who I was earlier in, in my elementary and high school. It was not until college that I began to see myself more in a positive light. And I'll tell you why. It's hard growing up in a country that erases my culture, erases my language, and also blames and just creates, just demonizes, you know, who, who I was back then. So it wasn't until college that I began to see all the beautiful contributions that my culture has produced in, in the world narrative of history, right? I went to college for, for Spanish to satisfy that question of who I was in this, in, in this world, right? Mm. And after college, what I've done is really think about how can I provide these opportunities for my committee members, right? Students, how can we know, how can we teach them that they have also been part of this amazing group of people that we don't hear about until we go to college. So I really want to produce these opportunities where students, community members can see that we have always been here. We've produced art, we've produced 
literature. And we've done so much that, unfortunately, the United States sometimes, or most of the time, just erases. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I was just looking at a LinkedIn post, and it talks about how when you aggregate all of the startup companies that have been started by immigrants here in the United States, the value of that is about $1.2 trillion. Just to put that in perspective, it's bigger than the overall stock market in Brazil and other countries. So absolutely, the immigrant community as a whole is alive and it's providing a better future for all of us here in the United States. I, I absolutely love that. Now, <clears throat> You know, because this show is about, you know, teaching other people how to avoid low-paying jobs mm -hmm. and, and really impacting our community, I'm curious to hear from you. Okay, you, you were having a rough time in high school, middle school. I think any kid does, and you add that on top of being an immigrant, not speaking English. I can relate to you. I know it, it was difficult, although high school is a little easier for me than, than middle school. What was it that drove you to say, look, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to go to college. I'm not just going to you know, quit school and, and just basically find work. What was that driver? Nestor, a big driver for that were my parents. You know, it was, I came here to this country for education. So I wanted to fulfill that, that dream, right? So it's like, okay, they brought me here. Now it is my turn to do that part, right? <laughs> And it, it's not that I was pressured. I always felt something that it was innate in me. I've always been in, interested in education. I've always had this love of learning. And it, was, it just came natural, right? So it was like my opportunity to continue learning more as a writer, as a reader, and going to college, which is what I needed and, and what I wanted. So also, in a way, honoring my parents and my, and my grandparents and ancestors who just didn't have these opportunities that... Um, that I was really having. Then. You know, it's interesting because in psychology, there's something called the Pygmalion effect. And the Pygmalion effect is that you will rise to the standards that people have for you. And it's so important to surround yourself with people who believe in you, who want you to succeed, because in turn, you're going to start thinking that way. You don't want to let people down. We as human beings want to satisfy people. And, and so for listeners, you know, that can go for, you know, how, how you're raising your kids or how you are trying to move forward in your career. You know, make sure that you're really aware of who you're surrounding yourself with at work, at home, with your friends. Because, again, you will rise to the standards that people have. If they have low standards for you, you'll have, you know, you'll have low outcomes. If you have high standards, you'll have those high outcomes. Awesome. So you went to college, started st studying Spanish, kind of a little bit of a journey of trying to find yourself and, and, and really figure that identity out. Once you did Spanish, you said you started finding your identity mm -hmm. and you started really wanting to involve with the community. That's something that really resonates with you. So talk to us a little bit more about your community involvement, what drives you, how, how can people really get involved through the community and, and how to go about it? Yeah. So I, began to awaken an interest in social justice through my Spanish classes, right? I began to see, really study Latin America through literature, began to see the things that were happening, the systematic issues, and this activism awoke in me in college without really looking for that. It just automatically, you know, came up. And I always wanted to use academics education as a means of providing more opportunities for for my community right so then i began to think critically why am i here is it just to build knowledge or am i here to really use this knowledge for improving conditions in my community right and i say this right now in such a concise way but back then i didn't really know what was going on i was still figuring out myself in college but then was very lucky that I went to a university that valued community service. It valued this idea about, um, you know, how sometimes you have or people have on volunteer hours. I began to see the importance of, of that. So I began to teach English in my local community because, again, I wanted to use that knowledge for helping them find jobs, helping them understand how to 
navigate that school education system for the students. So it was a way for me to to give back as well as build myself for other opportunities. So for me, it's like, how can I build myself and also build everyone around me? Yeah. And, and that really, my love for community, it just started there. I think that reading about Latin America's political state and just the contributions, and we think about it as an artist, right? As Nestor mentioned, I am an artist. So a lot of the things that I've always done is look at how artists are responding to social justice issues back then, right? So that was a huge motivator for me to understand what is my place here and how can I use this craft, which is art, illustration, writing for again opening more doors for for my community members yeah so it sounds to me that you know going into into this community involvement uh, i feel like most things is instead of going what's in it for me it's how can i have an impact in this particular opportunity that i have right now because that then will bring things back to you It'll, it'll give you opportunities that you never thought would be possible. Interesting. Okay. So so you started teaching Spanish. You started volunteering in college. College is done. What happens next? So I went to college and then I also went back to graduate school okay. because I wanted to finalize my, my career and, and teach the language, right? I learned how to uh, understand the language, the cultural literature, but then I, I had to go to one year degree to to become a teacher licensed in, in the state of North Carolina. And it was a great experience. I taught at predominantly a white serving high school with very few Latino Latinx students. And I began to see again the disparities between services that people receive. Right. And I had to really think again, how can I use my understanding, my love for language, for culture to again open more opportunities. And I did a lot in terms of helping families with, for example, in the freshman orientation, I helped translate a lot of documents that they were not available for these families, right? So looking forward to translating whenever I could for, for students and, and families being the Spanish teacher in this high school. I also did a couple of things like that. So it was going above and beyond for my teaching uh, duties to also help families feel connected, feel like they were welcome right? Essentially understanding that they were part of the system. Well, yeah, thank you for doing that. That's so important. Um, I remember as a kid, I had to be the translator for, for my parents and you know, I did my best, but when you're seven years old trying to translate a you know document that's written by lawyers, it, might, it becomes difficult. You definitely need, you need the Antonios in your life to help out. I also remember in college taking Spanish and I'm like, man, I'm going to this is going to be so easy for me. And the teacher looked at me before we get started. And she's like, I've seen people like you coming in this class, think that you're going to be able to have an easy ride. And you're not because you came here when you were seven, seven years old. And we're going to talk about grammar. And you don't know anything about grammar. And she was right. Man, that was so hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it definitely taught me definitely to take things a little more serious, mm -hmm. even if I, if I felt that I was prepared. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you got your graduate degree in Spanish. Mm -hmm. what, what, what did you end up doing afterwards? Yeah, so then I decided to come back to Durham, where my family is, is essentially from right now. And I wanted to do something a little bit more involved with committee members. And a job in a nonprofit opened at that time. And it was a great way for me to still contribute to this cause, but in a more direct way, right? And I say more direct because before I was teaching and yes, helping students become more culturally aware about Hispanic Latinx contributions in this country. But then I told myself, how can I do this kind of work and impact more families directly, right? And, and an interest shifted in me. So I wanted to do something more along education programming. And I work with a nonprofit here in Durham and began to do this. And I felt very much aligned with what I was supposed to do living here as, as, as a life mission. And ever since, work with families, anything from after school tutoring services to promoting literacy for adults to learn how to read and write in Spanish. Yeah, that's so important. 
when you talk about adults, how to read and write in Spanish, it was it immigrants that maybe have come here and they didn't, they didn't have that ability either? Correct. Yes. When we think about students in general, a lot of the times I don't see this conversation where the adults and the elderly didn't have the same education opportunities because many of them had to either start working to provide their family or just didn't have opportunities like that. So it was important for us to, that, to do that. <clears throat> yeah. My mom's mom, my grandma, she doesn't know how to read. She knows how to write a little bit, but not read. And it's interesting to me to hear your stories because, I mean, can you imagine coming to a country where you don't know anything? And on top of that, you don't know how to read. You don't know how to write. That's got to be the scariest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. And wow, what, what courage does it take? For people to do that that's that's really really amazing yeah. so you talk about building your brand mm -hmm. we've talked about building your brand and i think if you know people follow you and start getting to know you they'll see that that you definitely have a brand talk to me a little bit more about how you do that what's been the benefit for you and how do you how do you cultivate and, and continue to to grow that brand yeah so it's a great question in terms of how do we communicate the messages that we want people to know what we stand for, right? And I think that for me has been easy because I've always worked in, in jobs that align with my values, right? For example, opening up opportunities for students. So being an educator myself, it was natural to highlight the organization, but also make sure that I also have a narrative within this conversation. One of the things that I see a lot is sometimes workers may not see the opportunity to highlight their work, either because they are shy or maybe don't feel capable of tooting their own horn, right? And I think it's important for, for us to think about why are we here, you know, giving more visibility to these issues and solutions, not just issues. But how can I, what I'm doing, also open up more opportunities? To, to my community because when I share what I'm doing, more people are curious about the work that I'm doing and we have people reaching out to me and also increases my visibility. I don't do it as much for myself. I do it more in terms of my community members, but I also want to acknowledge that I am also being part of this work and I am also producing this, these types of outcomes. And I want to celebrate. I want to document I want to make sure that in a year I can go back and say, oh, I did all these things. You know, we accomplished so much. It's a way to celebrate. Not, not, not so much in a way to show off, more in a way to, to celebrate. And, and I think that wherever you go, that brand will follow you, regardless of what employer hires you, right? And, and that, in a way, builds advantage and momentum to who you stand for, right? And in a way, I always use that in a way to, to decide who I, who I want to work with. Right now, as, as a business owner, I'm consulting, grant writer, artist. I have more of, of a voice of what I've been able to do and say, no, thank you. If someone were to offer me a type of job that didn't align with my values, I would say that does not align with me at all. Gosh, man, there's so many good nuggets there. <clears throat> One of the things that I heard is really having purity of intent. Your your intent is is to document the progress that you're making and the impact that you're having in the community, and, and that's that's a pure intent. It's not it, it's not selfish, which which I really love because I think when we have purity of intent, we are at our, are at our best. We're motivated. Mm -hmm. We're doing our best work. Now. The other thing that you talked about is being able to view the progress that you've made over the past 12 months. Mm -hmm. And I do that by journaling. Mm -hmm. And it is it is so important for us to do that because it builds confidence. It gives us the ability to feel like we've accomplished something and have the, the agency to think bigger and do bigger because mm -hmm. we can come back and say, oh my gosh, look at all the work that I've done over the past 12 months. So there, there's this guy by the name of Dan Sullivan, and Dan Sullivan has this consulting company called Strategic Coaches, and he talks about how so many super successful business owners come to him, 
and they have this problem that they don't feel satisfied, right? They're always worried about what's coming next. How do we keep the, motive, the company moving forward? Mm -hmm. And what he says is, well, it's really important to have a clear vision of where you're headed and making sure that, that the steps that you're taking align with the values and that the work that you're taking, because you're going to have so many opportunities that come your way once you start you know, becoming successful of whatever you're doing, that it's really important to know how to say no mm -hmm. and, and, and have just this clear ability to say that these are my goals. A anything that comes from my way that supports these goals or say yes, anything that doesn't support my goals or my vision, I'll kindly say no to. Mm -hmm. But going back to looking back and, and Dan teaching all these people who have been super successful, it says that in order for you to have the confidence and, and have the freedom of creativity, you, you need to measure backwards. So mm -hmm. Never measure forward of, well, you know, because there's always going to be someone that's making more money in you, that's more successful in you, that's better looking than you, whatever it is. <laughs> but looking backwards and really thinking about that is is super important. So I love what you just said. There's so many good nuggets there that people can walk away with. So talk to us about now. What is Antonio doing now? What does he stand for? What are some of the things that you want people to hear? Yeah, so, you know, I think life always gives you different ways to get to a particular goal without knowing. You know, I was back in high school and college, not knowing that I wanted to be and follow this activism history that I now have. But as for now, I opened up a grant writing illustration business this year in January 2022 because I wanted to be more in control of my time, my energy. And I think that once I began to, again, build that brand that I had already, I already had traction. People knew who I was. So it was pretty, it was easy for me to make this jump, knowing that there was demand for these kinds of services, right? Grant writing, funding. Oh my goodness. There is money everywhere. All these nonprofit organizations, <laughs> <laughs> you know, receiving our fees, our fees, all these grant calls. So it was just the perfect time for me to do this. I'm not going to say it wasn't scary because it was scary, but it was the perfect time for me to do that. So since January, I've been writing grants and also have been working with nonprofit organizations in terms of fundraising, in terms of helping them achieve their financial goals. And still, I am in the alignment of being an activist, but now through writing, right, creating narratives creating budgets. I love that kind of thing. I love researching. I love reading. So all these strands really connect and, and came together now as a 32-year-old activist artist. And in the meantime, I do art to, again, uplift, to center my communities because far too long we have not been part of this narrative. So I want to make sure that I create the visuals that confirm that we are part of this history and inspire the next generation of students you know i don't want this to end with me which is why i never say it's all about me i really use it so that more people can follow as well and and see that one making a business and grant writing and art is possible yes absolutely i think anything is possible well i know for a fact anything is possible if you believe in yourself and what you have done differently than, than just being an artist is that, like you said, you've developed this narrative that people can relate to, mm -hmm. can buy into, can feel like a part of something bigger. And so hopefully some of your artist friends are listening to or will be listening to this podcast or even students. And you know, one of the things that I'll say is that it doesn't matter what you do is it's how you do it and what you do it for that will dictate how successful you are, what, what intent you have. Mm -hmm. So that's beautiful. That's awesome. Well, I, I really enjoyed, you know, listening to the journey of Antonio. Is there, is there anything else, Antonio, that you'd want to share? Any, any nuggets that, that we haven't discussed or any, any advice? Yeah, you know, for people who want to look into making a living out of art, and grant writing consulting in general, I think that one of the things that I always talk about is thinking critically about what society has told us 
around pursuing creative careers, specifically as someone from the Latino Latinx community, that is not a career that people told me I could do in the beginning, right? It was until I began to say, hey, there are artists out there, living artists, right, who are making a living. And it is possible. It's a lot of work. I'm not going to lie. It's not just about painting for me every day. There's adapting this business mindset in terms of looking at art as managing a business, right, with with the marketing, with the building the brand, with developing a voice, with developing a message. I think that that is a wheel that um, it's important for doing this full time. So for anyone looking out for these kinds of things in the future, yeah, I think critically there are, this is possible. And I, I really do wish that you pursue whatever purpose you're here for on this earth. I love it. And I agree with you, especially in your field. Um, I took a class to learn how to podcast because <laughs> I'm always wanting to learn. And one of the, the, the main example, there's a bunch of students in this class and it was being taught by this guy who was super successful, whose podcast ended up being bought by Spotify. And he had this artist as part of the community. And so she was learning how to storytell. It was really more about storytelling than anything. And she made a living and an amazing living. It wasn't just living. She was making a lot of money mm -hmm. because of the narrative, the way she thought critically about, mm -hmm. she wasn't just creating a picture. She was telling a story. Mm -hmm. She was involving the people who had commissioned her mm -hmm. to, to paint this thing. And, and, and I know you do that because I've seen your, your work and in, in, in the, in your post on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So I, I love that. And thank you so much for, for being here okay. today, Antonio. This has been, this has been awesome. Alrighty, my friends, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please remember to tell your friends about the show. If you're enjoying it, remember to visit greencards at greenbacks.com for amazing resources. And also those resources that I mentioned on this episode. Let's go have a great day and let's go make those greenbacks. <laughs>